It's a great honor to be with President Kagame. And we have uh, had tremendous uh, discussions on Rwanda. The job they've done is uh, absolutely terrific. We have trade with Rwanda. Uh, and just general, I would say, great relationships. Uh, I want to congratulate you, Mr. President, uh, as being the new head of the African Union. That's a great honor. This was just announced recently, and uh, that really truly is a great honor. So please give my regards. I know you're going to your first meeting very shortly. And please give my warmest regards. But it's an honor to have you as a friend. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Well, it was a great honor to meet uh, the President of the United States, uh, President Donald Trump. And uh, we had good discussions uh, on those two levels. Uh, the, bilateral relations uh, between Rwanda and the United States. Rwanda has benefited tremendously uh, from the support of the United <coughs> States in many areas where it is in peace support operations we have carried out in different parts of the world. We had the United States on our side supporting us. They have supported our economy in trade, investment. We see a lot of uh, uh, Tourists from the United States, visitors sure. coming to Rwanda, and uh, President, I wanted to thank you for uh, the support you have received from you personally and the administration. And uh, we are looking forward to also working with the United States at the level of the African Union, where we are carrying out reforms at the African Union so that we get our act together to do the right things. and. That helps in cooperating with the United States. Uh, it would be more beneficial when we are organized to know what we want from the United States sure. for that cooperation. So I thank you very much. Well, I thank you very much. And it's a great honor to have all of you here. And uh, we'll speak for a little bit longer. And thank you very much. Thank you. Into politics. Over the next hour, we will try to find out and give you the chance to get to know them better before the party decides who should lead them. All of you, thank you very much indeed for being here. I'll be asking the questions tonight. You have seen them in advance. You'll all get an opportunity to respond. Of course, please be as concise as possible. And the key here tonight is to debate one another. This is where you argue for your plans and test the arguments against one another, not make statements. And I'll follow up where necessary. And towards the end of the debate, each of you will get a chance to ask an opponent one question. And again, of course, none of you knows what that might be. Our audience tonight is you watching at home. You can take part in the debate using the hashtag ITV debate. So let's get going. Our first question tonight is on the central issue of this campaign affecting everyone at home. It won't surprise you to know it is about the cost of living. If you win, you will be prime minister in seven weeks' time. What is your big idea to immediately ease the unprecedented cost of living crisis that people are facing? That's the first question. Now your short opening responses, please. And Liz, trust to you first. Well, I understand that families are struggling across the country with energy bills, food bills and higher taxes. What I would do immediately is reverse the national insurance rise. I would make sure we're not raising corporation tax and I would have a temporary relief on the energy levy to cut people's fuel bills. And what I would do is unle unleash a bold plan to reform our economy, get growth growing, because we cannot get growth going whilst we're raising taxes. Thank That's you. very important. Thank you. Tom Tugendhat. Thanks very much. I've already set out plans to cut tax, which is why I didn't vote for the national insurance rise, and I've already set out plans to cut the fuel duty. The essential thing for all of us now is to set out an agenda that will see us able to deliver a growing economy into 2024, because in 2024 we are going to be challenged by Labour, by Keir Starmer, we need to make sure that our ideas and the growth that we have demonstrated are reinforcing the conservative principles that we all believe in. That's what I'm going to be delivering. Tom Tukat, thank you. Penny Mordant. Well, this is the most worrying issue for so many, not just families, but businesses uh, across the country. 
although I've not set out massive tax plans in this contest, that's the wrong thing to do, I have introduced some very targeted support to help struggling families. Uh, for example, halving VAT on fuel at the pump uh, and also looking to raise uh, personal taxation thresholds in line with inflation. It's incredibly important we do that. We've been taking Thank too you. much money into the exchequer off the back of inflation. Thank you. Kemi Bailey. I remember what it was like working on a low wage, flipping burgers and cleaning toilets, seeing my pay slip and all the, the money that I paid in tax. So I get it. And what I want to do is to cut fuel duty. It'll affect many people and it will make an immediate difference. But we need to look at why the cost of living is rising. And inflation is the problem. So tackling inflation will be one of the first things I do in an emergency budget. Thank you very much. Rishi Sunak. My number one economic priority will be tackling inflation and not making it worse. Because inflation is the enemy that makes everybody poorer. It erodes savings, reduces living standards and raises mortgage rates. And if we don't get a grip of inflation now, it will cost families more in the long run. So I will deliver tax cuts, but I'll do so responsibly. But I'll also get the economy growing, seizing the opportunities of Brexit to make sure that this is the best country in the world to invest and innovate. And if we can get that right, then we can all look forward to a brighter future. Thank you very much indeed. I'll bring in Liz Truss straight away on that. Risha, you have raised taxes to the highest level in 70 years. That is not going to drive economic growth. You raised national insurance, even though people like me opposed it in Cabinet at the time, because we could have afforded to fund the NHS through general taxation. The fact is that raising taxes at this moment will choke off economic growth in order to prevent us getting the revenue we need to pay off the debt. Rishi no. Sunak, respond to Liz Truss. No, I, I mean, we have to also recognise that we just went through a once-in-a-century pandemic with all the damage mm. that it did to our economy. And I think everyone realises that we were going to have to pay that back. But I'd love to stand here. I'd love to stand here and say, look, I'll cut this tax, that tax and another tax, and it will all be OK. But you know what? It won't. There's a cost to these things, the cost of higher inflation, higher mortgage rates, eroded savings. And you know what? This something than nothing economics isn't conservative, uh, it's uh, socialism. Under your plans, we are predicted to have a recession because you have raised tax, it is cutting back on growth, it is preventing companies from investing, and it's taking money out of people's pockets. That is no way to get the economy going during a recession. OK, but let me bring in Penny Mordaunt here into this. I think, well, I disagree with Rishi. I think you can... The, tax cuts I've outlined are not inflationary. But I think people listening at home will be looking at us de debating these issues and, and it seems that we're removed from the real problems that they are facing. They need some immediate action now. Um, I don't understand why uh, Rishi doesn't accept that. Uh, but I also think there's things we can do that don't cost any money. Making things work better for people. That's why I've introduced the childcare policy that I have. Okay. Making tax simpler so that it it reduces the cost that businesses are having to pay just to be tax compliant. There's Ke many things we can do. Kemi Bader, not Thank you, on Julie. It. I think what we're seeing in the discussion that's taking place is that there are no easy options. There are no solutions, only trade-offs. When I was working in the Treasury, it was always a choice between difficult option A, terrible option B, mad option C. And we need to be honest with the public about how difficult things are. The government can't solve everything, and we need to do better Did in terms of the way we fix things. Can, can, I, can I just come back on, on Penny's question, well, really, if that's Were there mad right. options in the Treasury, then, just briefly, Rishi Sunak, Sorry? on that point about mad options in the Treasury that can be based mad, on? Mad suggestions that people were putting forward, certainly, yes. From the outside, I yes. think Kemi was saying, <laughs> okay. when we worked, we worked together, she knows what those are like. But can I just yeah. respond to, to, to Penny's point? And because I absolutely do take this seriously, and that's why one of the last things I did as Chancellor was announce some significant support specifically targeted on the most vulnerable in our society because they're the ones that need our help most. But if I could just come back to Penny on one thing, because I think I heard, Penny, you on the, the, radio, on the TV this morning saying that you were going to scrap one of my rules, that the government shouldn't borrow for day-to-day -day spending. Now, look, it's one thing to borrow for long-term investment, but it's a whole other thing to the day-to-day -day bills on the country's credit card. And we know how that ends. It's not just wrong, it's dangerous. And you know what? Even Jeremy Corbyn didn't suggest that we should go that far. Very well, briefly. too many chancellors have had too many fiscal rules that they have then had to ditch because they haven't been able to meet them. I think you have to accept that we are in an unprecedented situation. We are going to have to do more for people to help with the cost of living. Where we really need to concentrate is on growth. And under your 
tax trajectory, that is going to be much harder. Okay, but, let's but, just, Penny, look, you, can you, I just you're, are, can you're I just... generally proposing that we, we borrow to fund our day-to-day -day okay. spending, putting those bills on a credit card. Literally, oh. Jeremy Corbyn didn't think that that was the right okay. approach. OK, I'm just going to pause there, bring it back to the question, which was, what is your big idea to immediately ease the unprecedented cost of living crisis people are facing? Uh, Tom Tugendhat, where do you insert yourself in what you've heard here so far? It is the immediate help that people are looking for. People will be looking at their bills, rising, looking into the autumn, knowing what's coming down the track on their energy bills. Absolutely terrifying. Well, look, we're all looking at energy bills at the moment, and I can tell you what mine are, and I can certainly tell you that many people in the community I represent are feeling it. And they're feeling it because what are we seeing? We're seeing chaos abroad. We're seeing increasing trouble from Russia. We're seeing increasing trouble coming from overseas, driving up the cost of energy, driving up the cost of inflation. We need to be absolutely clear that this isn't just about an immediate fix, and I've already set out a few areas where we should, like cutting fuel duty and making sure that welfare works better and smooths out that progress from welfare to work. But it's actually more than that. It's about defending the Conservative record and making sure that what we're trying to do is get ourselves into a position where we're helping families so that they can grow their economy and they can grow their own lives. Some of the comments that have come out of those that are supporting your camp, Liz Trust, are questioning the Bank of England's position in what uh, its impact on inflation. Can I just be clear on one thing? Are you suggesting you ought to think about changing the mandate for the Bank of England and its independence? I completely support the Bank of England's independence, but I think we need to look at the best practice around the world the countries who've been most successful at controlling inflation. And we need to look at the mandates they have, for example, the Bank of Japan. So the last time the mandate was set was in 1997, in completely different times. And we have to look at where we are now, Julie. We are in unprecedented economic times. And the business as usual economic strategy that we have the moment simply isn't working for the people of Britain. It simply isn't bold enough to deal with the crisis we're in and we've seen slow growth for decades. We need to do different, we need to be bolder, and we need to take on okay. Whitehall. And in, my, in my role as Foreign Secretary, I'm prepared to drive things through, and I'm prepared to get things done. And that's why okay. I Thank would you. do a good job. I just want to bring in Pemi Badenoch very briefly there, quickly. Just, just on the point about the Bank of England, they are independent. They're we set an inflation target, they're supposed to meet it. They haven't been meeting it even before this crisis, and we didn't really do very much about that. We haven't been marking their homework. The people who sit on the Monetary Policy Committee are human beings. They're not perfect. We need to be bolder at challenging orthodoxy and okay. getting things working properly. Is it time to relook at the Bank of England? Are they yeah, to blame for some of the inflation we've been witnessing no, and experiencing? No, I've been, I've been actually, actually I think, worried by some of the things I'm hearing from supporters of other candidates because the Bank of England's track record over the 25 years of independence is that inflation has averaged 2%. So everybody watching should actually feel confident that the people in charge of this will have a grip of the situation and get inflation back down. But I just wanted to, to go back on, on one thing, because Liz was asking about growth, and I do have a plan for growth, and it involves three things, investment, innovation, and education. Investment, because if you want better jobs and higher paid jobs, you need to have business investment increase. Innovation, because we have always led the world in creating the industries of the future, like life sciences. And education, if I could just say, an education, because our children's education today okay. is our economy if, tomorrow. If and if we, we can if get we, all of that right, that's how we drive it. Because Liz has this great Tom plan for growth, why haven't we seen it in his last two and a half years at the Treasury? No. Tom Tugendhat. Look, I'll leave Richard to answer his, his own record, because I'm finding it very difficult to understand who's disowning and who's defending the record of the last few years that they've been in government. It's pretty confusing to me, anyway. I think what we need to do is we need to focus on what we're going to do in the future, though, not in the past. And at the moment, we're getting definite promises of jam tomorrow, when a lot of people are looking for bread today. That re a response to that, Rishi Sunak? Well, all I'd say, because we're hearing a lot about promises, we've actually got to the point, we should just reflect on this as a Conservative party, where even Keir Starmer is attacking leadership candidates for peddling the fantasy economics of unfunded promises. If, if we're not for sound money, what is the point in the Conservative Party? It's the most conservative, <clears throat> as conservative values, and that's what I stand for. Okay, but it's, I'm just... it's, not a, it's, not a, it's not a choice uh, between sound money and uh, meeting people's needs and helping the economy grow. I think that the discussions that we're having this evening are, must be very peculiar to people sat at home. We okay. have layered and layered onto them incredibly complicated support schemes, which took you, Rishi, uh, you, you did it brilliantly. It was, you know, two minutes to just run through the whole list. 
I know from my background, it is incredibly difficult if you can't afford a bus fare, if you don't have a washing machine, if the services you are interacting with are incredibly complicated. Okay. We have to simplify this for people and we have to be more responsive. It's not, it's not your fault, Rishi. There's lots of things that need to be sorted at the Treasury. Thank but uh, the fact that Thank your you. energy package did not take into account uh, people okay. in HMOs is okay. an example of that. Thank you very much indeed. I'm just going to pivot this question slightly. Uh, we've been asking uh, you a lot about your immediate economic plans to ease the cost of living. A lot of people will be sitting and looking at their pay packets. A suggestion came from the Prime Minister, it was reported yesterday, of a 5% pay rise for public sector workers, for teachers, nurses, doctors, care workers. Inflation is running at around 10%. Uh, who thinks that 5% is fair? Who would like to come in on that, a 5%? pay increase for public sector workers. I'm, I'm happy to kick off. Again, this is not, I think this is not the place to be making judgments. We have pay review bodies as a process, but there are some things we can do to help our public sector workers. Let me just give you one example. If you're working in the NHS on band two, you get a new qualification, you want to move up to band three, but you're a woman that's on some of our legacy benefits, you're prevented from doing that. Okay. There's lots of things that we can Thank do you. as well as uh, pay levels. Brit, just bring Tom to you. What we need is we need the pay review bodies to be looking at this and giving their independent advice. That's exactly what they're there to do. But we also need to recognise that the government has a role. The government has a role in easing the tax burden and looking at the welfare system to support those who are in need. And that's why the household support fund for those who are most in need is so important. Kemi Bednar. It has been a really difficult time with public sector pay. We've been having the discussion about raising their pay for a really long time. And the fact is, the economy has not been able to sustain it. I would love to tell all the public sector workers they would get 5%, 10%. But the truth is, it's not going to be that easy. We need to create an economy that can fund it. And I'm not sure we're there yet. OK, let's be clear about this. On this pay offer we're hearing from the unions, the BMA, it's almost inevitable the path taken will lead us to direct collision with the government. The teachers will be looking to ballot the members in October. The nursing staff, the RCN, may feel they have no other choice other than industrial action or strikes. Judy, can, I, how can, would I, you, can I ask, how would you stop the strikes, Liz? So Truss? I was Chief Secretary to the Treasury, negotiating these pay, pay and terms with the unions. I think it is very important that the government does stick to our guns because what we can't have is a wage price spiral. We know what happened in the 1970s when inflation got out of control. We can't go back to that. So we have to be, we have to be firm. We have to get the best possible deal we can uh, in all aspects of helping our hard-working public sector workers. But what we can't have is these inflationary pay rises that lead to vast problems across the economy because they'll lead to okay. higher food prices, higher petrol Thank you. prices, Thank you. all the other problems people Rishi are facing. Sunak. I, 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 dare, say, I dare say there's probably a degree of uh, unity from all of us on this point. As Tom pointed out, we have a process where we have independent pay sector public review bodies and they balance the needs for recruitment, retention, what's fair and also what's affordable for the taxpayer. They make a recommendation to the government and it will be for the government to decide okay. whether to accept it, that or not. I think broadly I would imagine all of us would, would assume that that is sensible. People will be watching this accept. though and looking at the summer ahead of them and knowing that there are looming strikes at almost every corner at which you turn. How are you going to deal with that? So the key to strikes on this question is to do with trust. If people trust the government and know that the government is on their side, then people are more willing to make, go that extra mile and have that negotiation in good faith. And the absolute key to whoever we choose as Prime Minister is got to be somebody who people trust. That's why I'm arguing we need a clean start. Because we need somebody who the pay negotiators know is actually on their side throughout all of this. Now, as somebody who's served years in the army, I can tell you that unless you get commanders you trust, you never get the answer you need. Very briefly. I think the truth is we need to work better with the unions. We need to show them respect. I worked with the BMA when I was a qualities minister and we had issues around COVID. It is tricky, but if they know that you're on their side and you are trying to get to a good resolution, they will have faith and trust so in you. So an idea of getting on side with the unions from Kemi Badenoch. Thank you very much indeed on that. We just wanted to touch on that because it's a pressing issue for people watching at home. A huge amount uh, still to be done to help uh, people at home in many people's views. Let's uh, just draw a, a small line under that section on the economy and we're going to move on very shortly uh, to talking about why you think you're the right person to run the country and we'll be debating Next that. The Prime Minister, the ITV debate, we have the five candidates backing against each other to become the Conservative Party leader and run the country. Before the break, 
We asked the candidates if they'd be happy for Boris Johnson to serve in their cabinet if they became PM. No one raised their hands. I wonder if he's watching tonight. So let's look a little bit more at this issue of character, honesty, trust, and ask what qualities makes a good prime minister. So the next question that I'd like to put to you all this evening. Many would say that Boris Johnson was ultimately brought down by lies and dishonesty. What about you as a person would make you a better prime minister? That's our question that we're going to debate. First of all, I'm going to turn for the short opening response to Tom Tugendhat. Thanks, Julie. It's quite clear that what we've been through in the last few years is a crisis of confidence in our government. Our government has been collapsing trust as though it was a concertina, and what we need now is a clean start. Now, I've demonstrated on operations in the military abroad and in Whitehall that I'm willing to stand up not just to our enemies but to our friends and to call out where we need to make changes. Thank you. I'm willing to do the same now. I'm ready to serve. Liz Truss. I'm somebody who says what I think. I'm honest. I was uh, brought up in Yorkshire. I say what I mean and I mean what I say. And I'm somebody that when I promise to deliver something, I do deliver it. It's one of the reasons I was so concerned about us breaking our manifesto on national insurance is we committed to the British public that we would do it. I might not be the slickest presenter on this stage, but I think my colleagues understand in Parliament, when I work with them, that when I say I'll do something, I do it. I've shown I can deliver Thank you. as Foreign Secretary. Can you vote Julie, you asked a question about whether we would have the current Prime Minister back in our Cabinet. And the reason why I said no is because it's time for change. It was very difficult for me to resign my job last week. It took a lot of courage because I knew what would happen afterwards. And that's one of the things that I show in every aspect of my work. Being brave and, more importantly, using that bravery to protect other people. Whenever other people have had difficulty, such as people who I hired who got um, attacked in the press and in the media, I've always stood up for them. And I'm somebody who wants to bring unity back to our party. I'm tired of us being Brexiteers and Remainers. It's time to move on and come back together. Thank you. Rishi Sunak. You know, I think it starts with being honest. And as people have seen in the debate we had earlier, I want to be honest with the country about the economic challenge that we face and what is going to be required to deal with that. And that's not politically convenient for me to, to not just say the easy things, but I think it demonstrates to people that I will be honest with them about what lies ahead and I'll be responsible in dealing with it, even if it's not politically easy. And I think that's what people should expect from their leaders and that's what I would do. Thank you. Penny Morden. Well, you asked what would make me a better Prime Minister and it would be a really good team. My whole campaign has been built around building a team. Uh, my now legendary campaign video did not feature me at all. It was all about my colleagues and it was all about the country. And I think our leadership model that we've had in politics is completely broken. It doesn't deliver for people and we need a new approach. I recognise that and I would look to build a team of all the talents in our party. Thank you very much indeed for that. The question, many would say Boris Johnson ultimately brought down by lies and dishonesty. What about you as a person will make you a better prime minister? Tom Tugendhat, you made a very clear point there. You believe that only a clean start makes sense. Can any of those who serve in Boris Johnson's government, those around here, tell them why they shouldn't be doing it and you should? Well, it's very difficult because, of course, whatever your responsibility was in that government, whatever your place in that government was, Keir Starmer in two years' time is going to hold that record against us. And we need to make sure we're winning Conservative seats across the country. And even really good people lend credibility to the chaos. Can, can we not? Uh, I'm not uh, ashamed of anything we did uh, in government. We have a lot to be proud of. We got Brexit done. And what the Prime Minister did <clears> on Ukraine <throat> and on vaccines was fantastic. Serving in government is not easy. It requires taking difficult decisions. Tom has never done that. It's very easy for him to criticise what we've been doing. But we have been out there on the front line making the case for Sorry, why, Kimmy, I, I for have why been on we the have front done line. the right I've been on the front line not, in Afghanistan not in government, and Iraq. Not in government. And I've been on the front line of the argument against Putin and against China. I've yeah. changed government policy on this. But you haven't taken any decisions. These it's are decisions. easy to talk. Talking is easy. Yeah. Talking Julie, is easy. I, I have served as Foreign Secretary during the worst war perpetrated in Europe for decades. It was right for me to stay doing my job so we could continue to stand up to Vladimir Putin, we could continue to support Ukraine, and we could work with our international allies. We have led the free world on the response. 
I think it would have been completely irresponsible of me to leave my post so at this vital time, not just for our country, but also for global security. Was it irresponsible for Rishi Sunak to his post? Tell him what you think about that position. Well, I felt that I owed a duty to our country to continue while we were facing this very serious economic and security crisis. Respond yeah. to that, Rishi Sunak. Res resigning from government is a, a really serious thing, and it's a very personal thing, and everyone makes those decisions themselves. For me, you know, I tried to make it work for as long as possible, but it got to the point where, for me, enough was enough. We all saw what happened on the Chris Pincher situation, and it was clear that I had big disagreements with the Prime Minister in terms of being the direction of our e economy. But I would just say, you know, what that experience in government has given me means that I'm the only person who has the experience to lead our country okay. through Moore, a very significant economic challenge. Because that's what I've done for the last okay. two years, I'm and that's what we're going to need now yeah. looking are, forward as well. We are all good colleagues, and I think colleagues have done what they felt was right over in difficult circumstances. But what we have to learn from this is that what we have been doing previously has not been good enough. We have to all reflect on uh, the failings, I mean, not just recent events with the uh, Prime Minister, but why we haven't been able to move at the pace that business and science demands, why we haven't been able to give uh, businesses and our communities the opportunities they need. It is not about individual people. It's about the model well, of politics and okay, government. Okay, but the question was very specifically about character and your personal qualities. And one of the things that I just want to pivot slightly here on is the nature of the debate and the nature of the campaigning that we've witnessed since that extraordinary event uh, 10 days ago. A lot of people are sitting at home looking at this top toxic campaign being waged against one another and wondering where that takes us in terms of the future of our politics. Can I, Baden, can I just come to you? you uh, we're going to touch on the issue uh, that Penny Mordaunt has been questioned about and the self-identity uh, on the transgender issue. First of all, you questioned Penny Mordaunt's honesty on that, her recollection, and then you questioned whether she'd understood the issue correctly. Uh, just set the record straight. What exactly are you saying there? And was it helpful to the nature of this debate? I am uh, saying debate? that when I took on the role of Equalities Minister, we had to change the existing government policy, which previous ministers had put in place. And what uh, I am challenging, or what I challenged Penny on, is what that policy was. She is saying she did not agree with it, but I don't understand how that would be the case. If she had been the previous minister, if she didn't agree with it, why was it? Why was the policy as it was? Talk to Kemi Bay. Well, look, I, I wasn't the previous minister. Um, the stuff in the papers today uh, demonstrates what my policy was uh, and refutes this. But I, I think this whole thing is unedifying. And I would just say to all four of my other colleagues and candidates here, I, I know why this is being done. But what I would say to you is that all attempts to paint me as an out-of-touch individual will fail. I'm the only person on this stage I'm just that the has truth. won and I'm fought a Labour seat. I'm telling the My truth. constituents Finish, do not elect people who are out of touch. Liz Truss, you wanted to come in. I did want to come in. I, I believe in the Ronald Reagan dictum that you shouldn't speak ill of a fellow Conservative. And this campaign has to be about the future. We are in a serious situation as a country, <laughs> Some of your a, war in Europe, have, Liz Truss. a war in Europe and a deep economic crisis. What we can't have now is more business as usual in government. And we need somebody who can go into number 10 on day one and get things done. And that's what I've done throughout my career, whether it's the trade deals, whether it's the response to Ukraine, okay. I've actually got things done people and delivered. Been, people who've been following this uh, campaign from all quarters and all of the different campaigns here will know that your supporters have been calling people out. The language that has been used, the insinuations that are used, they've been accusing Rish, Rishi Sunak of disloyalty and worse. Well, I certainly don't believe in that kind of campaign. It's not the campaign I'm fighting. I'm fighting a positive campaign about the future because I want to unleash the are potential you, Are you leading your British campaign, people. Liz? Are you I, leading I'm your very campaign? clear with people in my campaign that we should be focusing on the core issue which is facing Britain, which is how do we drive up economic growth, which is not just a number in a spreadsheet. This is about people's futures, people's jobs, people's opportunities. The, the, that is what I'm 100% focused the on. The first campaign meeting I had in this contest, I said to my team, we are going to campaign as we're going to govern. Mm -hmm. And people 
want a brick with the toxic politics of the past. They want us to be putting forward positive ideas. They want us to be valuing colleagues. And I really hope the poor, the poor viewers have a month of this to come. And I hope we can have actually a better contest okay, in the coming weeks. Thank you weeks. very much indeed for that exchange. I want to come to Rishi Sunak here because within this question, embedded within this, is questions about trust, character and judgment. There has been big questions. There have been big questions about your judgment when it came to your green card status and your wife's non-dom status. So I've always been a completely normal UK taxpayer. My wife is from another country, so she's treated differently. But she explained that in the spring and she resolved that issue. But look, there, there is commentary about my wife's family's wealth. And so let me just address that head on because I think it's worth doing because I'm actually incredibly proud of what my parents-in-law built. My father-in-law came from absolutely nothing and just had a dream and a couple of hundred pounds that my mother-in-law's savings provided him. And with that, he went on to build one of the world's largest, most respected, most successful companies that, by the way, employs thousands of people here in the United Kingdom. It's an incredibly conservative story. Actually, it's a story that I'm really proud of. Okay. And as Prime Minister, I want to ensure that we can create more stories okay. like theirs here at home. All right, thank you very much. So that was our question on character, integrity, judgment, toxicity and politics. Uh, let's move on to an issue which is still very much part uh, of this campaign, uh, not least because it was on the front pages, uh, quoting your predecessors uh, yesterday. Um, however you feel about the Prime Minister, he had a message for all of you on the front page of one of the newspapers yesterday. Whoever succeeds him still has to finish the job on Brexit. So as a reminder for everybody at home, could you raise your hand if you voted to leave in 2016? Three voted to leave, the remainers, the remainer voters, Liz Truss and uh, Tom Tugendhat. Um, Penny, if I can just come to you first, if you're a true Brexit believer, Actually, to Rishi Sunak too. Why are so many key Brexit voices falling in behind Liz Truss? Well, I think that people had a, a vision uh, for when they voted back in 2016, but also in 2019. And that was a sense of the country that they felt we could be about creating more opportunities at home, but also about being a force uh, for good around the world. And um, I would just point to uh, the fact that I have managed to attract people from across the party, Remainers, Brexiteers, behind my campaign. I've not had the platform that some of the candidates have in this contest, but they're coming to me because actually, unless we can unite and win the next general election, all that we have been through over the okay. last few years will be for nothing. Kemi Badenoch. It's time to move on from Brexit. We, we left the it's EU. Unfinished we business, got, though, it is not it? unfinished business. We got Brexit done. What now about it's the Northern now Ireland it's Protocol Now bill? it's time to take advantage of the opportunities. We have left the EU. The public is sick and tired of us banging on about Brexit. We need to start talking about the future of our country. And I am the wild card candidate here. I think a lot of people cannot move on from it. It's time for us to do that. The big headlines on you're clearly not moving on from Brexit with the stuff that you're putting in the papers this morning, Rishi Sunak. No. So I, I was really proud to support Brexit. And at the time, there was a lot of pressure put on me and others to not do so. And I said our career would be in peril. But I did the thing that I thought was right for our country. It, you asked about support. I'm actually really delighted to have the support of very senior Brexiters like Liam Fox or Dominic Raab or Theresa Villiers, as well as support from across the party. But what's important now? is that we deliver on the benefits of Brexit. And just to give you some examples of the things I've been doing, actually, we're creating new free ports in places like Teesside that are bringing jobs and investment there. We're reforming the hey, system he, of taxation for alcohol and, for and you, we're reforming And we're reforming all the regulations maybe, maybe, in financial services to unlock billions for our companies. Okay. So actually what I want is to see that same energy devoted Liz, to Brexit across all departments of government. You, and Trust. that's what I'll deliver as Prime Minister. The reason but, I am trusted on Brexit is since 2016, I put my shoulder to the wheel and I've delivered. I delivered more dozens of trade deals at the Department of Trade, including ones people said wouldn't be possible with Australia and Japan. I've delivered an entirely new sanctions regime to target Russia and we've led the free world leading the G7 on targeting Russia. I've also put forward a bill and put it through the first stages in Parliament 
to resolve the issue of the Northern Ireland Protocol, which was a naughty bill. OK. It's because I'm somebody who gets things right. done in Thank government, you. and that's what my colleagues see. Just very briefly, Tom Tugendhat. So I have to to lots of section. very, very kind supporters who are coming from the Brexit wing of the party, and I'm delighted they're there. But I agree with Kemi. It's time to move on, because the opportunities before us are all there. What we need to do is to release the money in our savings and make sure we're investing, turning okay. dead money into live communities. And that's how we're going to grow the economy Can I give and be Keir Starmer in two no, years I just want to draw a line there because I want to fit in as much as possible into this <laughs> hour and I appreciate we're putting a lot in there. We're going to have something now a little bit different. We're going to give each candidate an opportunity to ask a question of one of their rivals, a short question and response. And we will start this section with Kemi Badenoch. Uh, so, thank you. Uh, my question is for Rishi. Uh, Rishi, uh, I believe we need to support people who do the right thing and not let those who don't off the hook. And when we both worked in the Treasury, myself and other ministers raised the issue of COVID loan fraud and you dismissed us and it has cost taxpayers £17 billion. Why didn't you take us seriously? Well, that's absolutely not right. We've taken ta tackling fraud incredibly seriously and set up all the systems in place to go and recover money from fraudsters, including new units, HMRC, giving Why new powers. And actually, billion? at this point, dozens of arrests have already happened and billions have been recovered. But, Rishi, but it's important... Um, Fiora Agnew, one of, one of uh, your former ministers, resigned on this issue. He is supporting my campaign, not yours. Why is that? Yeah, well, Theo's uh, entitled to his own view. But actually, I'm, I'm proud of my record. And to take us back to that moment, we were on the precipice of over a million businesses going to the wall, millions of people losing their jobs. And this was not a question of weeks to get money out to them. It was a question of not even days, it was hours. And actually, we tried a system which went through an enormous amount of paperwork and bureaucracy, and it took two weeks, and it wasn't going to work. Okay. So I took the decision to design something okay. that made sure we supported over a million businesses. Right. And you know what? We, the latest uh, estimate... We asked that question uh, since, it, since, since so Theo left... Since okay, Theo okay, left... In the this is hours. really important, Julie. No. <laughs> Actually, since Theo left, the new estimates, what the fraud will be on the bounce back loan scheme, have been reduced by a okay. third. All right. And the I'm payment performance on that loan I'm portfolio well. okay. is actually you'll, far surpassed you'll all have a chance anyone's expectations. Richardson, I'd really like to give you the opportunity to just draw breath there because you are the person to pose the next question. Far away. Ah, right. Uh, my question is for Liz, actually. And uh, Liz, in your, in your past, you've been both a Liberal Democrat and a Remainer. I was just wondering which one you regretted most. <laughs> I am somebody who was not born into the Conservative Party. I went to school in Paisley and Leeds. I went to a comprehensive school. My parents were left-wing activists, and I've been on a political journey ever since. But my fundamental belief, and the reason I am a Conservative, is I saw kids at my school being let down in Leeds. I saw them not get the opportunities, not get the proper educational standards that you might have got at your school, Rishi, I saw them wasted, having wasted potential, and I thought that waste was wrong. That's why I'm conservative, because I believe that everybody needs to have that opportunity. I believe in high education standards. That's why I'm proud I introduced the new maths GCSE, which my daughter is now sitting, that gives people a better grounding. That's why I'm proud of signing all those trade deals, so we can give opportunities to companies right around this country. That's why I became a Conservative. OK, thank you very much. I'll let you draw breath and ask the next question, Liz Truss. My question's for Rishi. I'll, I'll give him that. that. I'll give him that. <laughs> Rishi, do you, st do you still think that we should be doing more business with China? You know, I, I actually support the view of the integrated review, the plan that you and I both sat around the Cabinet table and helped draft, which highlighted that China was an enormous threat to our national security. And that's the lens in which we should throw it. And Tom deserves actually credit on the backbenches for highlighting this issue, you know, uh, amongst others. And he was very early to it. Uh, and the right approach to that is to take the powers and the protections we need to protect our country against it. Something actually you and I, Liz, have worked together on to make sure that we have legislation that stops hostile investment into this country, protects our national infrastructure. But also, as the head of uh, MI5 recently said in a joint speech with the head of MI6, where our values and interests are protected, of course, we, okay. we should engage all with right. China as we do engage We're with all countries. We're trying to keep these nice. Stop. Really quick, uh, come back uh, there, Liz Truss, and then I'll move to you. So you don't want to go ahead with 
the economic and financial dialogue with China. Yeah, my, my, my view is when we can protect ourselves, as we now can do because of the powers that we've taken, okay. that shouldn't stop us from engaging with countries around the world. Thank you very much, also, both. We'll making, leave sure, making sure that we stand up for our values, that. open up ourselves up to those in Hong Kong Thank as you. we We're do, leave something that, that all of us are probably proud of. And turn to Penny Mordaunt. It's your turn to ask a question. Well, Who's I, it to? I'm sorry. I'm afraid it is to Rishi. Maybe you should have got one of those spinners, and we could, <laughs> it might have been a bit uh, a bit fairer. But um, the the first job of any prime minister is to defend the nation, and we made a manifesto commitment on defence spending. Uh, we know that our armed forces are under great strain, and we have commitments uh, to NATO and other partners as well as that manifesto commitment. Why won't you raise defence spending? Penny, of course the most important job of the Prime Minister is to keep us safe. And that's why, as Chancellor, I actually made sure that the MOD, our defence, got the largest uplift in defence spending since the end of the Cold War. I singled out the Ministry of Defence for special treatment in the middle of COVID so that they had that certainty, they had that record uplift, so they could do everything that they can to keep us safe. So I've already increased defence spending, and because of the investments we're making, it's forecast to increase even more in the future. But my approach to this is simple. We should take a threat-based approach to defence spending, not fixate on arbitrary targets, but do whatever is required, and that's what I will do. Okay. Invest whatever is required to keep our country Rishi safe. Sunak, that's my commitment as Prime Minister. Thank you very much indeed. Tom Tugendhat, your question. Well, I'm not going to pick up on defence, just to say that 10,000 troops uh, being made unemployed is not exactly the defence. Okay. Would you like to pose your question? I will pose my question. It's actually to Penny. Oh, it's my... soft. There we go. It's soft. Uh, Rishi gets a break. <laughs> Look, I've set out various policies that I think are important to defeating Keir Starmer in the next general election, to making sure that families understand that we're on their side now, not in the years to come when we're promising uh, income tax cuts when they're convenient. What, I've, what I'm wondering is, if you're asking people to support you as Prime Minister, which is what we're doing tonight, when are you going to tell them the details of the plans that you're laying out? Because surely people need to know the details for them to be able to decide. Because Keir Starmer won't be waiting at the general election, and we won't be able to give him that space now. Well, I think there's a couple of things that we need in order to win a next general election. One of them is me as the Prime Minister, because the polling shows that I'm the only one that can beat Keir Starmer and take the fight to Labour. I beat true. him it's all over the country. Not true. I beat him in not true. London. I'm that's polling best in Scotland true. with young people, red wall, blue wall seats. That's why uh, I am subject to a, a great deal of, uh, of focus from your no, supporters. Penny, I respect you deeply, but the but second, that's not that's the, second, that's uh, really the okay. second thing we need what? is we need a vision, a narrative to take us from where we've it. come from, all the work that we have done together, which has been good mm. uh, because of COVID, because of all sorts of other things, we have not been able to move as fast as we would have liked. Unless we have that narrative, folks, uh, unless okay. we can also set a vision for how we're going to get that Brexit dividend we, Thank you. and deliver for people, we will not win the next general election. I can do that. I'm okay. the most prepared candidate in this race. OK, thank you very much, all of you, for your questions. A couple of quick questions now, just a quick run round to see what you say. If you become Prime Minister, you'll be leading Britain on the international stage. If you were Prime Minister, would you sit down with Vladimir Putin at the G20? Yes or no, Penny, Penny Mordaunt? Not under current circumstances. Tom Tugendhat. No, and I've demonstrated that I'll fight for our country in combat and I'll fight for our country in politics and I will continue to do so. But sitting down with Vladimir Putin is not the right answer now. Kemi Badenoch. No, I wouldn't either. It hasn't worked for all the people who've tried before. I wouldn't waste my time. Thank you. Liz Truss. I think it is very important that we have the voices of the free world facing down Vladimir Putin. I was prepared to face down Sergei Lavrov I'm prepared to say to Putin directly and call him out in front of those very important swing countries like India okay. and Indonesia. So Thank I would you. go there and I would call Putin out. OK, Rishi Sunak, very briefly, yes or no? No, Sit down. I actually, I walked out of a G20 meeting when the Russian finance minister Thank was you. taking part. Thank you very much indeed. Quick fire question now on climate. Uh, today we have our first ever red warming for extreme heat. It's rising already inside and outside this studio. The severe effects of climate change clearly becoming apparent. Your COP president, Alok Sharma, has threatened to resign if you fail to lead on the climate crisis we face. Can you confirm there will be no backing down, absolutely no backing down on our commit to, uh, to net, commitment to net zero by 2050 if you become Prime Minister, Penny? 
I'm committed to that, but it mustn't clobber people, our plan. Uh, it has to support our levelling up an industrial strategy and our energy resilience. OK, Tom, have it too. Now. I'm committed to making sure that we deliver the nuclear reactors to keep <coughs> us green, that we deliver the nuclear re reactors that are going to drive an export economy, the carbon capture and storage in Scotland, and, all, and change the way we do wind farms and so that we can actually deliver quicker. Because at the moment, the problem is we're seeing energy price rises hurting everybody, and that's what's making life more difficult for everyone now and will be in the winter. It was supposed to be a legally binding target. Kemi Badenoch. We, the, the truth is, Julie, we set a target for when none of us will be here to, take, uh, to be accountable for it. If there are things in the plan that will bankrupt this country, I will change them. If there are things in the plan that will make life difficult for ordinary people, I will change them. I do believe in climate change, but we have to do it in a way that is sustainable and that will lead other countries. If we damage our economy, they will not follow us and then we will not solve the problem. Liz Truss. I back the net zero target. We need to deliver it in a way, though, that doesn't harm people and businesses. That's why I would have a moratorium on the green levy, take it out of general taxation so that we can relieve the pressure and find better ways to deliver net zero. Rishi Sunak. Yes, because this is uh, about our children. I have two young girls and this is about the inheritance that we leave them and, and uh, everyone's grandchildren. In the same way I care about the burden of borrowing and debt that we leave them, I care about the environment and climate that we leave them. So yes, I do support it, but we need to bring people with us. And if we go too hard and too fast, then we will lose people and that's no way to get there. And I think we can get there in the way that's about growth, it's about jobs, it's about the industries of the future, and that's the way to do it. Briefly, back to Kami Baden. Uh, if we bankrupt ourselves, we will be leaving a terrible future for our children and I will not allow that. Okay. I just think it's a bit of a shame that we haven't yet financed the carbon capture and storage elements off the northeast coast of Scotland. Okay. when we're shipping carbon over to Norway. We should have been doing it years ago. OK, thank you very much, all of you, for that. I know it's a quick, quick run round uh, this subject. Uh, we're almost at the end of our hour together. Uh, we've heard a lot about how you think you'd like to move the country forward tonight. The last time people went to the polls in this country, Britain was in a completely different place. We've lived through a pandemic. It's been an extraordinary time of upheaval. Should you win isn't the only way for you to get a mandate for your new vision to put it to the people and call a general election, yes or no, Penny Morden? We, no, we all stood on the same manifesto. We all have to come together and it's a shared manifesto and a shared vision. Thank you. No, we have a manifesto to deliver and I intend to deliver it because by showing leadership and showing commitment, we can bring the party together, bring the country together, end this disunity and actually have a clean start. Thank you. I think people are tired of broken promises. We made some promises. We should keep them. They're also tired of all yes the no upheaval to and, the, uh, and no, no to a general election for that reason. Thank we you. need to give people some stability. They're tired of all the upheaval. Thank you. No to a general election. We need 100% of our effort on delivering for the people of Britain. I'm the person that can do that. Rishi Sunak. No, we face an enormous economic challenge and we now need someone who's got the grip and the experience to deal with that and that should be the priority going forward for the next year. OK, thank you for your observations. I think that's a resounding no to an imminent general election. Uh, they're clearly not that keen on the idea. But that is it. We have come to the end of our debate. It's now time for our candidates' closing statements. And for that, we'll turn first to Rishi Sunak. We have a choice. Do we confront the challenges we face with honesty and responsibility or not? I'm standing because I believe I'm the best person to lead our country and the only candidate who can take the fight to Labour and win the next election for our party. The stakes for our country are high and only I have the experience needed to deal with this economic crisis. But if we take on our problems with honesty and determination, Britain's potential is limitless. My parents worked hard to give me the opportunity of a better future. And that's what I would do for your children and grandchildren as your Prime Minister. Thank you. Penny Morgan. If you're still watching this debate, well done. I wish tonight had been a little less about us and a bit more about you. I know you've got serious concerns and these are really uncertain times. Our model of politics is broken. Our model of political leadership is broken. You need someone who knows why it needs to change. 
and has a plan to do that. And that's me. Thank you very much, Penny Mordant. And now we'll turn for a closing statement to Tom Tugendhat. Thank you very much for watching this evening. This evening hasn't actually been about us, and in many ways it hasn't been about the Conservative Party. It's been about you and about who you need as your next Conservative Prime Minister. Because the reality is this country has been facing problems abroad and is now facing challenges at home and around the world. And the government, I'm afraid, has led to a lack of trust and a collapse in that confidence. We're all asking the right questions. But the real answer is we need a clean start. Because we need to restore confidence in our government and in ourselves. We can do it. I'm ready to serve. I'm ready to lead. Tom Tugendhat, thank you very much. Turning now for a closing statement to Liz Truss. The next election is going to be about the economy. We only have two years to show the British people we can deliver. I can hit the ground running at number 10, driving economic growth by cutting taxes and delivering tough reform. I've shown what I can do on Brexit, on trade and on Ukraine. I've shown that I'm trusted to deliver. Britain's best days lie ahead. We need to reject the voices of decline. And as Conservatives, we need to stop apologising for who we are. I will lead a government of all the talents that unleashes the full potential of our great country. Liz Truss, thank you very much. And the last of our closing statements, the woman in the middle, Kemi Badenoch. I said that I was the candidate who would tell you the truth. And I am. I'm doing this not for myself, but for the future. I have three children and I want the very best future for them. It is vitally important that we create a strong United Kingdom that is confident in itself. I moved to this country nearly 30 years ago and the United Kingdom is a beacon of shining light in the world. That's why so many people want to come here and we need to make sure that we keep it so. So a future that is confident, bright, strong, secure with a wealthier economy. That's what I'm about. I'm the candidate for the future. I'm here to be honest with you. I can make a change and change things for the better. Kemi Badenoch, thank you very much indeed for that. And that, all of you can breathe a sigh of relief at the end of a fast-paced hour. It brings our evening together to a close. We've covered everything from the economy to Brexit to character to Putin and beyond. Thank you very much, all of you, for taking part here this evening. And that brings us to a close. But that political debate will continue, of course, across the media, also, of course, on ITV News at 10 tonight. This week, Conservative MPs will choose the final two candidates before party members choose their new leader and our next Prime Minister. Thanks to all the candidates for braving the heat and to you for watching at home. The US, when they borrow money, they're getting it in 1.5, 1.9 interest rate. Africans, when they get the same amount of money, they're paying 9, 10%. The people who don't need a break, they get a break. The ones who need a break, they don't get a break. The sheer survival of the World Bank IMF is based on the fact that African countries and, and many other developing countries do not succeed. Their success is based on our failure. That has to change. And guess who can make that change? We, the children of Africa, we, the Africans, are the ones who have to say, we know your game now. Enough is enough. We're not playing it anymore. And this is where the diaspora come in. There are more Ghanaian doctors in New York City than in, in the entire country of Ghana. There are more doc Nigerian doctors in LA than in the entire country of Nigeria. So let's be serious here. What Africa needs is capacity, capacity, capacity. And that capacity is in the diaspora. So it behooves us to bring the diaspora together. Let them understand what is really going on in our Africa. Diaspora are not going home. Diaspora are angry about Africa because they are not understanding the root cause of why Africa is where it is today. They think getting rid of a president will take care of the problem. Far from it. That president is just going to be replaced by another one who is going to equally suffer from the same difficult environment to work in. So let's look at an Africa that must be free to take care of herself, an Africa that's free from exploitation from outsiders. The multinationals who are stealing from Africa every day in broad daylight. I use an example of the DRC. If you ever fly very low over the DRC, you'll see tarmacs in the jungle. 
You'll see 747s flying into DRC, picking up minerals and flying right out. The same multinationals are responsible for arming young people and giving them MK-16s. Because why? Their satellites in the skies are telling them where that village is. There's, there are lots of diamonds. So what do they do? Arm young people, drag them up, and send them to go chop off a few heads. The rest of the village runs away, so they come behind and do their illegal mining. We black people must understand what is really going on. Because what we are shown instead is, oh, look at those Africans killing each other. There are some serious games that have been played in Africa for far too long. And once we understand that, we can strategize as to how we can begin to bring the difference and bring the change that Africa needs. And that change can only come if the African diaspora are united and the Wakanda villages, as I call them. It is our organized way of saying, starting with one African diaspora center of excellence, it will be a new city, a developmental hub that we can then take from there. Every sector is developed. Take healthcare. How many doctors do we need in this region to take care of this many people? We pick up education, same thing. We pick up engineering. We pick up electricity. How many megawatts of power do we have in the region? How many do we need? Be it solar, be it wind, be it hydro, be it geothermal, be it nuclear. We were singing, when you were singing, the masters of the field were coming. We who are boys are coming. The masters of the field are coming. We who are young boys are coming to win the race, to win the race. We trust in God, we trust in God to win the race. We trust and that's for, in God. And that's for Opokuwa. Masters mm -hmm. are coming, masters are coming, mm -hmm. masters are coming to win the race. Oh, 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 oh. masters are coming. And then they will sing, Prepare the world, yeah, prepare the world, yeah. Then we go more, then we'll keep quiet. Mm -hmm. Then you will sing, ah, when they're tired, they will come in. Mm -hmm. Diplo, Owens. Diplo are we again. We have to win the risk and take a cup. We are the masters of the field, the best athletes, famous to all and decent boys. How diplo? Then they will start. I'm going to go to the hospital. I'm going to go to the hospital. i I'm going to uh, e levy, e levy, e levy, Kasana, Yakasagana, Ubi Arika, e levy, inti, say, say, me, ti bing me, ni e levy. Because e levy problem, no, a e simple. Now, Ghana government is on Peso, Otia, say, inti, ne, ye, betre, much then, no, what, Tia, see ye, it was your fool. 2020, IMF, ma, Ghana, one billion dollars, billion with a B. Same year, no, World Bank ma Ghana, $430 million. Nina for COVID. Every year, you know, in 2021, no, IMF for Sam ma Ghana, $1 billion. $1 billion with a B. Now, World Bank for Sam ma Ghana, $130 million. In the 20, uh, 2021, no, so I have one billion one hundred and thirty million yeah. If he World Bank buy any IMF buy no, now we say post COVID rejuvenation program say what be ma young economy no so. In the World Bank ni IMF this is Ghana ma Ghana. Ghana government call Bank of Ghana koyi twenty billion cedis say COVID in the. Now we say for World Bank ama mu two billion. Uh, IMF Amamu 2 billion. World Bank Amamu 560 million dollars for COVID. I know on some, Musan call Bank of Ghana Kuyi 20 billion cities. Say COVID in T. Say Sikano will move Hong Kong time trying here. And I will move. We'll move here. Baby, I will be for Ghana. E levy tax. We'll call ports. E levy. We'll call airport. We'll call hotels. Be but they are to be bearer so organa. E levy, e levy, e levy. Says he can hen alpha petrol, e levy. Uko union ma port, e levy. Says he can hen alpha na. Inti se ne government a peso or tre yang se. Ghana fu ebi a ya junene nye jumentina or de sa e levy nereba. Yan si a pesi a tre government se. Enye se ya juni nye jumu ye hu ne kosono ni e jai amano. 
If you say who per se wunya e levy, young yeah yeah responsible citizens, yeah per se yeah yeah. Uh, uh, stand by. Yet, do you know how Yet, train for you. Or no one can say yes. Yeah, responsible citizens, right? Into yeah, responsible citizens. Now, the thing is, say, so what person would free sika? Now, would he be a beer? Because young credit rating record former. Any young abrabo now the eleven barber to so. I didn't because there is over three, almost three billion. Ghana cities a record to the presidency. Three billion Ghana. In it also by 75%. What also by 75%? I will say by 375 million dollars. 375 million. Save and not at the presidency. You don't need three billion Ghana cities going to the presidency. Then now what are you? Mr. Kufuado. And the Koso war presidency. Then now what is the presidency? Mudi ye deng, mudi shi usuruku, ana deng na mudi ye. Legislature, le Ghana legislators, ye wo 275 legislators. Deng na sa legislators no, wo ye ma Ghana. Se se meno mo kase, he, Ghana fwe, ye be to me afa, I install it, Watson, IBM computer, wo friend is Watson no, ah, e ye artificial intelligence, e be ye over 90% of yen, Parliamentarians, you know, you bet me replace one with Watson. Watson computer, Ben Wedjuma. Now, you down downscale. I think you hear 275 parliamentarians out. Then, why you Ghana? One liability to Ghanaians, you know, over 100,000 cities every month per parliamentarian. 100,000 cities. And what you what was what judiciary? Judiciary, hey. America, yeah, 330 million people. 11 times the size of Ghana. Ghana, yeah, 30.8 million. America, were nine Supreme Court judges. A Kufuado Bana, saying, Ghana, near what 10 Supreme Court judges. A Kufuado, our 28. I can't. In this case, Ghana, 30, a country of less than 31 million people, no? Yeah, what? 18 Supreme Court judges. Ding ne how yang. 18. Ding na adding yang na just a kronger will be seen now. Ghana ne won't ye hear Supreme Court judges. Ding tin ye won't Supreme Court judges. A country of less than 31 million. 18 Supreme Court judges. Ka ka one Supreme Court judge be no liability. Ebro hundred and fifty thousand dollars. Hundred and fifty thousand cities a month. Kona kubun kunta he ne V8 order them ne bodyguards ne ne driver ne ne te, ne krone ba deng inti ni yafa an extra eight Supreme Court judges and un kwan cheng se si amene moka say ye wo thirty four wo friending ambassadorial post around the world thirty four Vatican City. Ah, a will room cry ye wo ambassador wo ho. Deng na ambassador wo Vatican City ye magana. Mon kan chile ye nge. A deng ni ye wo ambassadors wo baby to say Malta nom ne eh, wo friend deng Sri Lanka si eh, Sudan nom ni ade. Deng o komo na ye ni ade ba inti ni ye wo ambassadors wo Sudan. It doesn't make any kind of sense. Se wo re e levy. What is this? Ye san wo eh, 58 uh, uh, diplomatic missions around the world. Diplomatic mission, no, and Kahun Fasuna said, What will trade desk are at the income commerce a bread Ghana? So, diplomatic missions around the world, they are 50 80. Sika Beng, what the bread Ghana? Moon country near here. A year crong waste of money and resource. Musa Mohu E levy. Your bachelor must say E levy no moon corner moon coy infimua mut for two positions now. My creator who named Fasono and Hona moon coy infi. I think that more how Ghana for sa MPP for think that Ghana for why you want to na debi a yenti a se yenti a se no sa positions he na he was he wo wo over two thousand executive positions sa wo wo executive benefits ne perks wo to kwang wo business class wo nya four by four no money a de sa ni money ne si wo yifi ho ana what also e no no be ma ilevi no income from ilevi ni yebe nye fi ho mroso mroso mroso. Then necessary a catch there a good for the new government. Says Sadeno, Munko ye in Fihonum, Namu Boka Gana for car unnecessarily. Namu Bue ye ne ye 
na excavate sa unyankupu ando miye nse ye nsa unko ka ni ye nang na niye mfa nye sika niye mfa nti uye yi levi kason mwa be kache nse mwa kwa shiwe excavate 85 excavate sa bako ye over 150,000 to 200,000 mwa sa kwa shiwe na kahon na pano no wehi ye zi kop no wehi eh, ti no wehi ya anom kop no so awa abona kahon hey ekufu ado and his government why gana fo ye mpenende mpene china ye levi no wana ye zibashe wana anu wa kwa yifu isika no waza apa ye mpen ene le wakwene eh, ye ni mu babe ku ye be jine mu dine ning se ye mpene ekufu ado and his government adeng adeng what say when uh, cluelessness meets unpreparedness, no MPP in Funi now be home. Oh, we're not gonna take this, we're not having this. Mumfa, yam penine, impenitina, eleven, ye chia, Munko, inko cut, legislature, Munko cut, executive, Munko cut, uh, judiciary, Nasi can ambassadors, any. Uh, we're friending uh, uh, ambassadorial post and uh, 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 the diplomatic missions. So, I'm going to cancel, no more reduce, no more for computers. And you have legislators say, you want 275, you know, you bet me the drone, drone, I replace you one. You're here 275 at the maximum four per region. You're here 64 parliamentarians. You're here 211 parliamentarians, you know. Where your liability to Ghana at about 100,000 cities every month. Yen chawong in fiho. Come on, enough of this nonsense. Ye rim. Ye rim. I want you to wear the symbol. Okay. Okay. So when we are the symbol of knowledge, strength, adaptability, <laughs> energy, freedom, unity, hope, peacemaking, harmony, intelligence, Continue. power of love. Strength. Said in class symbols when you are a obia bra bobia ebia or boy, yeah. Now the sign and no pepper no. Now yet the aka and in class symbols in a home. Okay. Now Ghana for what I see I who no say. Said the another than Koku for the Ebu ne mine. You need your home. And see, this is the in class symbol for failure. What? It's a free nerdico. Said in class symbol. Who spells him? You know ya. I can't in class in Bosom. The president is now a free Nanako who is best in the new way. I can't in class in Bosom. Photo and a in class in Bosom. You are a failure. And I beg and pay for what you are saying. Yana Nanuma Motina see here in class in Bosom. You see Mumia for Winka. This photo and in class in Bosom. I'm about to hear of this. I'm about to hear of this. I'm about to hear of this. This is where you want to use your life. I'm not going to do that. I am a boat worker. Money. It is a castle. Oh, man, you're here, my. Hey! Then, now, a memoir and quiet, you know. Mother. I come to you.